All right. Good evening, everyone. It is the 14th of July, 2020. You are here for the athens Clark County Mayor and Commission special called session and work session. And given that we have a special called session for the purpose of entering into executive session for discussion of acquisition or, and or disposal of real estate, um, we do need a roll call from the clerk. So, Madam Clerk, if you could do that for me. Davenport. Here. Parker. Here. Blink. Here. Wright. Present. Denson. Here. Edwards. Here. Harrod. Harrod. Present. Thornton. Canby. And we have a quorum. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, a motion for entering executive session upon conclusion of our work session. So moved. Second. second. All right. I believe I have a motion from Commissioner Edwards, a second from Commissioner Wright. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, following our two work session items, we will enter executive session uh, for discussion of acquisition and or disposal of real estate. And speaking of the work session, we just have two items this evening. And the first is a transit update, a uh, regular occurrence here. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our transit director, Butch McDuffie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate that. And uh, I hope we can get this right. First time I've had to do one of these uh, with this group. Uh, but thank you, everyone, and good help everybody's have a good evening. Uh, tonight we'll be talking, actually I do this might help a little bit, uh, but uh, I wanted to talk with you guys and do an update on our transit program. We had talked about an update several months ago with management and because of our COVID pandemic issues, it kind of got pushed back, but I really want to try to help you guys understand the situation that transit currently is in and what we've done over the last few years and as we move into the coming FY21-22 cycle, some things that we're really going to have to think about and on how we uh, make our system work, fund our system, and how we look at our system as a whole, because there's a lot of things uh, in the works right now. With that, I think I can share my screen here, and, uh, and I'll make sure that uh, you guys uh, can see this. If somebody will tell me, do you guys see what we got going on there? Can uh, you see my presentation here? Get back to the front page, actually. But <clears throat> okay, can everyone see that? We've got it. Awesome. Okay. Well, again, uh, you know who I am, so we we'll skip that part. But anyway, again, we're going to talk about our current services and our service area. <laughs> our funding, our major projects, things like that that are going on. Our, 20, our 2018, sorry, 2018 to 2022 transit development plan and our system development, where we're at in that process, some of our service delivery challenges, and, of course, our 21 and 22 operating budget and funding outlook. Uh, easy stuff that we can do really quickly. Uh, we've got about 100 employees at transit yeah. now. 80 of those are full-time. Right. Uh, of course, they're all broken out through this. Is most of them are in operations. Everybody knows that. We've got two major facilities, Multimodal Center, which opened in 2006, and our operations and maintenance facility over on Pound Street, which is actually, actually opened in 1976. So it's uh, it's been there quite a while. I know everyone knows we've got about 500 bus stops and sort of benches and shelters around our community, and we've been working on those that program since uh, about 2004. <laughs> Uh, buses and services we've got out there. Of course, we've got 32 buses now. Uh, we've got uh, 16, 18 of those are hybrid electric. And as a matter of fact, two, we've got some staff in California right now this week inspecting the first two 35 hybrid electric buses that are coming down the pipe. And they should be on uh, the streets here within the next month or so, be delivered in another uh, a couple of weeks once they get, get them off the line and get them inspected and everything. Uh, ridership. Generally around 7,500 a day with 24 buses during the summers is usually around 3,800 with 16 buses. That's the current service level we're operating today. And what we have operated since April 29th of this year, 
we're still watching that. Actually, our ridership is a bit higher than this. I was working on this uh, over the last few weeks, getting it through the manager's process, and some of these numbers has changed. We're seeing about 4,200 riders a day right now on our fixed route service. Of course, our paratransit service, the, the van service we have for mobility impaired passengers, it's seeing about 1,000 rides a month. Uh, our service area, we have pretty much have the same footprint we've had for the last 15 or 20 years, except for the area that's up in the Highway 29 Danielsville Road corridor out to Spring Valley Road. That's our Route 30 district that we started uh, back in 2018, 2019 time frame. Other than that, this is pretty much the same footprint we've had for many, many years. We use the one quarter mile buffer because that's generally accepted in the transit industry. If you're within a quarter mile of a bus route, a, roughly a 10 minute walk, you're considered to have access to public transit services. That's the fixed route buses. Uh, paratransit services is a little different. Our American Commission back many years ago, I want to say about 2003, uh, they elected to go one mile on either side of a bus route for anyone who needed uh, mobility and it was mobility impaired and needed paratransit services. So this buffer zone here you see around all these routes, except for the areas where they kind of venture just a little bit into the uh, outlying counties, those are only for turning around purposes, by the way. That's just that's the only terminus is out there just because it's the safest place to turn around. And uh, if you're using paratransit services and live in this yellow buffer zone, you have access to our paratransit service and in turn we can link you with the fixed route services necessary. Uh, our cap, you know, actually, any questions on that real quick before I move on? Or would you like me to just keep going? Yeah, Butch, if you go ahead and move through the presentation, then we'll kind of collect questions okay. at the end. Okay, no problem, sir. All right, our, big, our major funding projects that we got going on, most folks know that our cap, most of our capital is funded through federal grants. We get about an a, 80% match on most grants. Some grants we get a 90% match. The feds will match 80%, 10% sometimes comes from the state on grants. The big things we got going on, we have going on right now are about $400, $4 million worth of hydroelectric vehicles that are coming down the pike. We've recently done the uh, upgrades to our automated vehicle locating system, our MyStop program, and we put automated passenger counters on all the buses. And we're actually buying all our IT equipment. Most folks don't know that the transit department buys their own computers and uh, things like that for our use. We pay for them with grants, which helps save general fund dollars. One thing you'll notice, uh, if you're out about by the library, the public library, we just put in a demo uh, e-reader uh, solar sign out there just last week. It's the demo. I mean, so if you go by and look at it, just let me let you know it's the demo. But we're working on getting those in. So we're going to see about uh, seven or $800,000 worth of electronic signage go on buses and around our community in the next six to eight months or so. And, uh, of course, uh, actually, this is $3.4 million. That, the bus stop improvement program included solar at our shelters. It included, included our bus stop improvement. It included our art shelters and all the different improvements you see out there in the community for facilities. That's about $3.4 million. Those funds are going to be expended at the end of this year in December. So uh, we'll, we're going to be kind of short on any additional new improvements out there. And, of course, our facility improvements and capital maintenance, we've got about $750,000 in a grant right now that we're working on for that. That's kind of outside of the CARES grant. We'll talk about CARES grant a little later in the program in the presentation. Here's just some of the pictures of the things that we're doing out there. You've seen the buses, some of those great new uh, shelters that are out there, the art shelters have really been a big hit. Solar, we're getting solar all over the place. And uh, again, uh, we just good things are happening with that particular program. Uh, our transit development plan, this is going to be very key, uh, for, especially for some commissioners that have not been on the commission for very long. We are required to do a transit development plan once every five years by the federal government. It's accepted and approved by our mayor and commission. And then we use that kind of as our strategic plan as we move throughout these cycles. We did one in 05, one in 2010. And, of course, the latest one was completed in 2017, 18 time frame. And I want to say it was April of 18 when it was actually accepted by our American Commission. What we do with that is we try to look at that and try to predict 
what's going on in the community and where things are going to go by looking at a lot of different demographics. Uh, our next transit development plan update is due in 2023. The things that we look at during that process are on this slide. They're things land use, population, population density, neighborhoods, social uh, economics, transportation, everything that's on this slide, the, the modal shifts, policies that are in place, or what we see happening either at the federal level or the local level, uh, everything that we you could think of. This, the transit development plan we currently have, which is available on our website, is about 400 pages long. It also has information in there about finance and cost and cost projections. It has things like what we would want to do for frequency, days and hours of service, service coverage. You know, uh, one of the things we had in the, this last one was to do uh, increase our frequency and our hours of service. Well, we, we got some of that done. Uh, we didn't get a lot of that done, and that was because of funding issues, and we'll talk about that a little further later. Service coverage, expanding routes, super stops. We've got about $500,000 in the Keys Plus money to, to build super stops. However, that funding is in one of the out tiers. I want to say it's in 22 or 23, but the funding's not quite available yet, and it's really not enough to do what we had really envisioned in the first place. We were able to establish a, a, and fund a, a staff, actually, an aggressive marketing program, and many of you have met our marketing coordinator, Rachel uh, Hopkins, and she's been doing a fabulous job of that. And of course, we did revise all of our route system schedules and maps back in the summer of 2018. And if you remember, we got a lot of pushback on some of that, uh, but those were things that recommendations that came from the TDP and what our citizens had told us they'd like to see us have to see happen. The challenges that we've had with this, though, uh, is really paying for some of those initiatives. Each year when we go through the budget process, you know, staff will submit uh, new initiatives. Most of them, they don't always make it through the end of the budget cycle. I know there's a lot of competing uh, funding things out there, and we've got 20-plus different departments that all need money and revenues are down and things like that. But just in general, if you want to operate a regular fixed-route bus, one bus, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, it's going to cost us about $300,000 a year. So we have to remember that when we start looking at expanding services and things like that. Whenever you do things like that, you also have to remember you have to expand your staffing and your support and your equipment proportionally. You've got to you, you've got to buy new buses if you're going to buy new if you're going to have new service on the street. You got to have new maintenance, new mechanics, new route supervisors, and of course new operators as well. So identifying funding for operations and maintenance has been the biggest challenge we've had, literally in the coming up on 19 years that I've been here at, at the, as your transit director, and finding funding sources to keep this system going and keeping. It moving above, keep it, it nose above water, and of course, expanding services. We, we just uh, have a challenge with that. Some of the other challenges that we have today is on time performance. Uh, for example, Route 20 is the same footprint that Route 20 was. That's the one that goes from downtown to the mall along Atlanta Highway and back. It's the same footprint that it was in 2001 when I came here. Back then, we were operating one hour frequency. Could maintain that maintain 30 minutes out, 30 minutes back, and we could maintain that frequency relatively easily. Today, we're having to look at possibly going to 75 minute frequency on that route because traffic patterns have changed, ridership has changed, you know, signalization processes have changed, and, and it's not just that corridor, it's all over our community. And that's why we believe we need to increase our transit services uh, because we just can't get out to these outlying areas uh, as efficiently as we used to with the, with the heavy crunch of on-street traffic. Uh, staffing has been a challenge for us for the last 36 months or so. It's just very hard to get qualified transit vehicle operators, mechanics, and, and folks. Everyone knows our economy was doing very well up until the last few months, and jobs are plentiful, and getting the folks out there to drive buses is just hard to come by. We recently ran an ad for a transit vehicle operator for 14 days, and we got 10 applications. And out of those 10 applications, only three 
were selected for actual interviews because of their experiences and, and background. The other challenge that we have is our operators are dealing with a lot of abuse on the street. So we've got operator, uh, excuse me, passengers out there that are really being verbally abusive. We've had operators threatened on a regular basis and being just treated very uh, rudely and inappropriately. And we try to do the best we can for every passenger we have on the street. But unfortunately, there are passengers that just think that uh, they, uh, uh, they they just don't treat people well. And that's just unfortunate. We, we often run into issues of having to bar passengers for unruly behavior or threats or even in violence. Luckily, we've only had a couple operators in the last several years that have had an actual uh been assaulted and uh, but we don't we want to protect our employees as best we can and uh, we think we need to look into our policies on how we can do that further on in the future ridership changes has been another big issue that we're having to deal with because of the COVID-19 we've seen a huge drop in ridership we also saw a huge drop in revenue and I know everyone saw that across our uh, community and across our nation is that uh, ridership over the, the last couple fiscal years before that was down quite a bit and really it's dropped about 40 percent since 2015. That comes from a lot of different things. Really it comes from things like uh, we've had some expansions of campus transit out into other areas of our community, medical school campus or the vet school. We've got things going on with apartment complexes operating their own shuttle buses, Uber, Lyft, ride-sharing programs have changed a, thing, a lot of things. And, of course, our downtown density has changed quite a bit. Young people's traffic pa uh, travel patterns have changed immensely. And the big drop in our ridership is UGA-affiliated ridership. And, and uh, it's just young people's patterns have changed. They don't want to wait for buses anymore. This graphic here will show, uh, you know, back in 2015, we had about 1.5 million rides of that over 800,000 for UGA affiliated rides and local, what we call year round ridership was almost 700,000. Well, that flipped in 2017, almost equaled out. And it spiked uh, for local ridership in 2018. And we were up to 788,000 rides, local rides in 2019, but we only had uh, 450,000 UGA rides. That's a million rides less than what we had five years before that. Just because our students are, are, are using different forms of ride or travel. The other problems we have is frequency of service. When you send four buses out on Riverbend Parkway and all four of those buses are filled up every 15 minutes at capacity, people take a different bus or they take a different route. And we just don't have the equipment or the funding to add additional buses in those corridors. The reason why we can't do that is exactly what's on this slide. Since 2015, our budget has remained essentially the same. As a matter of fact, the FY21 budget is $16,000 less, operating budget, $16,000 less than what it was in 2015. We've done, this has happened because we've been trying to save general fund money. We've been trying to find other ways of of funding our services, and we've used alternative funding, but we haven't grown in. There's no growth in our transit system in the revenue side of it, and we can't, although we've dropped the general fund contribution by as much as 30%, you know, and since 2018, when we started using the Transit Enterprise Fund net position, we've saved over $5 million of general fund money. Budget stayed the same, however, you know, we got no new transit services uh, from that, but we did save the general fund, which has been a priority. Revenues are also down exceptionally because of the uh, ridership changes. Uh, here's another example of our operating budget, and this is what we've done. 31% of our budget is paid for by general funds. So roughly 69% is paid for of, through other means. And as long as we stay in this cycle, we're never going to see an increase in transit service or never going to be able to afford increased transit services without new revenue streams being identified. 
This leads me into what's going on with the CARES Act. We This year, we were very lucky. We worked hard with our local partners. We looked, worked hard with our national association and stuff. And when the CARES Act came out, transit did very well across the country. And we were able to get just over $10 million to help save the local investment, local general fund dollars between January 20th of this year through June 30th of 2021. What that's done for our 2021 budget is taken two point, roughly $2.5 million of committed general fund dollars and allowed you folks to use that in other areas of our community that needed it at this point of time. So our general fund investment this year in transit is zero. That's a 100% reduction, which is great on one aspect, but on the uh, next hand, it hurts us. Because when we go into FY22, we're going to have some very significant challenges. We've got what was going to be about $1.8 million in general fund and about 800000 in our net position. We would, that would give us roughly a $2.6 million shortfall. And I know we've heard a lot of discussion about going fare free. We want to go fare free in FY22 moving forward. Uh, we're going to be about $3.5 million short in revenue as we go into that budget cycle, which honestly is not that far away. Staff will start working on that budget as early as November, December, and making projections on what we're going to be submitting to you folks as we go into the, 20, the fiscal 2022 cycle. Uh, one of the things that we'd like you to understand is that the transit department does provide a very vital service to our community. We actually do operate at a very high level of efficiency. We reach about 80% of our urbanized population. The majority of our funding comes from sources other than the general fund. 90% of our capital is paid for with lost or t plus money. As a matter of fact, we have not asked for any general fund match for capital projects since 2018. And, uh, you know, we're doing very good, but we just cannot continue this process over the next couple of years without identifying some other alternative funding sources. And so without those additional operating uh, operations and maintenance on in funding, you know, we can't expand services. And I hear people ask me on a regular basis, what can we do? Can we expand here? Can we do this there? We would love to, but we just are not able to do so without additional revenue. So our recommendation as we move into the 21 cycle is not to do anything at this time until we can identify some additional revenue streams to help fund the operations and maintenance of our system. And with that, I'll be happy to entertain your questions. Butch, just uh, to kind of kick off the conversation, uh, you, you're probably aware we had a planning retreat in the autumn, late autumn, and one of the commitments that the commission and myself made was that in looking at our next TSPLOS package that'll be in front of the voters in November of 2022 to committing a quarter of that TSPLOS one penny to transit, both for capital and uh, maintenance and operation. Um, you know, rough ballpark, you know, that would give us about $6 million a year, which, you know, ideally would provide for significant frequency increases in some of those um, high density routes, particularly given that the planning department is looking at some higher density node development like the mall area and like the area around the corner of College Station and Barnett Shoals, um, but would also allow us to absorb the, the cost of going fare free. Uh, I, I guess what I'm interested in just in kicking off the conversation is, you know, what would it look like to bridge to that point where we would begin collections of a prospective 2022 T-SPLOST, you know, which essentially would entail fiscal year 2022 and the first part of fiscal year 2023. Uh, you may not be able to answer that tonight, but I think um, operationally, functionally, as we look at the coming budget years, if we can bridge that 18 or 20 months, you know, we'll we'll see a real new day for transit, and and then have I think a strong platform from which to to build out what have been some of these long time recommendations. 
Well, thank thank you for sharing that, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, but yeah, and I did, and we did have that conversation. I didn't want to bring that conversation uh, into the, the presentation here. Transit operates on about a six million dollar budget a year, and so again, we're if we're looking at the fare free and uh, operating match, we're talking about three and a half million dollars a year is what we need locally. Now we do have some opportunity in the net position that the transit department currently has as we move forward uh, into FY22. Right now we're looking at around two and a half million dollars as, as long as the uh, net position stays the way it is. We don't have any any major uh, changes in that. And we're pulling that down to $1.8 million that we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, that would leave about $900,000 going into the 2023. So in easy numbers or just estimated numbers, we're going to need between two and two and a half million dollars a year for those two years. Uh, and I, of course, can do those numbers a lot more accurately, but just general, about two and a half million dollars a year to get us to that peace boss. 2023, I assume the, the collections would be fall of 23, or is it fall of 22? The uh, the referendum would be fall of 22, and I think collections would start uh, first quarter of that next calendar year. First quarter of cal calendar 23. So, yeah. So, then again, getting through 23, yeah, you're, we're, we're talking in, in general somewhere in the in the the four to five million dollars to get us to that point. Now, with the, with the net position, uh, we might be able to get down to around three. But again, I'll have to do those numbers and really crunch those numbers for you to get our finance folks involved in that conversation. Okay. Um, well, I, I've a, got that. I see Melissa. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if maybe the attorney could address some of the legalities of. Um, you know, possible um, like add-on fares or fees to um, motor vehicle registrations that could help fund our transit system. I know that other communities do that, probably not in Georgia. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you know, as, as per state law, could we possibly do something like that? Maybe that's something that we could have Judd's office investigate yeah. as, as they look at the corollary between state code and local allowance. Or, you know, some kind of add-on fee when it comes to, um, you know, some of that denser development. You know, if we're going to do those nodes, if maybe there is, you know, annual fees or taxes per bedroom or something that, that assumes that, you know, the, if, we're, if we're encouraging denser development to have transit access, maybe there's some kind of annual revenue coming out of that development that goes directly to transit. Yeah. That is not an area that I'm, I have researched, but we'll have to do so immediately and get some guidance from the commission on that issue. And yeah, and some communities have, um, I forget what they call it, but it's, um, you know, a, a tax where, um, I guess it's a commuter tax, and I don't, I'm not sure how they how they determine it. I guess maybe they work with major employers, but um, determining, um, you know, fees for people driving into the county from other counties, and then that helps to service local transit. The last time I looked at that, Melissa, was maybe five-ish years ago. And I remember at the time, state code didn't allow for that. You, you, you're probably aware that New York City and some other big metros have uh, identified that as, you know, as both a way to raise some revenue as well as a way to decrease congestion. Um, I mean, maybe that's something we bring up with our state legislators. We're facing dire revenue shortfalls in our transit. We want to encourage smart dense transit accessible development, but we need to keep our transit services up. So maybe we can we can have some discussion about um, changing some state laws on that to enable dense urbanized communities to keep um, keep some decent transit service available. Um, Mayor, Mayor Gertz, Mayor yes, Gertz, I know my hand is not up, but my computer is down. Yeah, go right ahead of you. But uh, so I'm on the phone um, for the listening or, or, or audience and plus for Gene to count me present. Um, one of the uh, things that disturbed me listening to uh, Butch's report is um, some of the uh, abuse of our drivers 
Um, and I think he said that we probably need to look at some policy um, um, changes or policy suggestions that could um, protect or enhance the safety of our drivers. Uh, Mayor um, Gertz, is that something that could be delegated to a committee or should we wait um, for the retreat to discuss? Uh, it, it may well be a, an area of committee examination. I, I'd, I'd be interested in uh, kind of a follow-up report from Butch, uh, you and your staff, just to give us a little bit more of the nature of of these, and that that I think then gives us some foundation to understand. Okay, well, what what solutions may there be to the specifics of the problems we face? Thank you, um, Mayor. I just want to um, put that out there. We do not want our government um, officials, whether they're driving the bus or working at City Hall, to be ab abused by anybody. And um, um, I, I don't want that to go over or underlooked. So thank you. Thanks, Evita. Uh, I see Patrick's hand up. Get on mute button. Um, uh, I just got a couple questions for Butch about um, what does our advertising costs look like for the side of the buses? Is that increasing or decreasing? And um, can you explain um, the cost of lift and how can uh, a resident get a ride on lift? Okay, so well, on advertising, actually, in our upcoming uh, voting session, there is an agenda item moving forward right now to award a, a up to a five year contract to HALP Advertising, which is our current vendor. They've been in place for five years. The contract expired, and we did an RFP earlier in the year, and they it's been awarded to them. The advertising revenue is down, has been down since the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis started. As a matter of fact, it was down about $5,000 a month over the last, since uh, March. It generally generates somewhere between fifty-five dollars and $75,000 a year. Uh, in the contract, there is a guaranteed minimum, uh, about $55,000 a year. But in the contract, you also, if we get... 50% of, of uh, net revenues after expenses, we split that with the advertisers. So if they do, if they sell more than $55,000 a year, uh, we get an increase on that. That's what's taking it up to the higher number sometimes. But we've never seen more than about $70,000 a year for onboard advertising revenue. It's just not a, a great market. Uh, a lot of that is... Uh, a lot of the people that make money on that, they do it with advertising on shelters and other type of advertising. It's not the bus billboard type advertising. Uh, so that's where we're going with that. So, but you guys will see that agenda item coming through this month uh, for approval. And uh, that's uh, they're a great company. We've been working with them for, like I said, five years now. So we hope that you approve that. We move on working with them. Uh, as far as the lift, there is a process. The lift services are a federally mandated program that goes on whenever it's included in, in the grants that we get for operating funds. I often have uh, said to the manager, you know, I, I read that 50 page contract, although I know the mayor signs it, but I read it real close. And uh, there, it's one of the things that we have to do. It's called complimentary ADA paratransit service is the official name. We call it the lift. We're required to do that by the federal government up to three quarters of a mile on either side of a route. Again, like I said earlier, back in 2003, our local government elected to do one mile on either side of the route. And that was that buffer zone that I showed you uh, earlier on the map. An individual has to be medically certified to use that service. So they have to have a mobility impairment that prohibits them from riding the regular fixed route bus. And there's a lot of different caveats to that. It could be a heat-related medical issue. It could be a cold-related medical issue. It could be because uh, they are wheelchair-bound. They can't get to the bus stop because there's no sidewalk to the bus stop. There's a lot of different things that go through that process. But individuals that need information on that can either go to our website, the, the Athens-Clark County ATC Gov, uh, 
com forward slash transit. They can download the application there, or they can come see us and we'll get an application or email us and we'll email them an application. They fill it out. They get their doctor to fill it out, certify it. Our staff, it's returned to our staff. We have staff that's trained in how to certify these folks under the ADA program. They'll review the application, provide them that certification if they qualify, and then they call in and schedule their trips. They have to do that in some cases up to two weeks in advance. It's kind of, uh, it's uh, the demand response program is a dial a ride. You, you call in, you request a trip, the, op the operator has the ability to negotiate the trip with you within an hour or so, either side of your original uh, request, because we're trying to get more than one person on the van. We, we just, we'd like to have two or three or four people on that van instead of just one, because it will pick you up in front of your residence or wherever you need to be picked up in front of and take you to your destination within a mile of any fixed route bus service, and then it'll pick you up after you've done that appointment and return you to where you need to go. But anyone that has questions on that, they can, by all means, can contact us you know, at, at, at the Transit Information booth and get applications there, or they can email us, and we'll be happy to guide them in that process. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Um, just a, one quick follow-up question. So the federal government gives uh, subsidies for that program? And they're included in the overall grant. It's a percentage. Right now, it's around 10% of the overall grant. So we get about 2.5 from them. I think we're putting about $300,000 a year in that program. We currently have five vans. We're funded to operate three vans. Uh, 12 hours a day is what we do. So uh, they're out there, those vans. The other two are just spares. One, so we're one, ones are down for maintenance. But we operate about, I want to say it's 28 hours a day of service. So we have less in the middle of the day. We have a bigger demand during peak times, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. And then from, say, 3 until 7 p.m. You don't need as many vehicles on the street during the middle part of the day. But it, it's just part of the overall funding process. All right. Thank you. Thanks, You're Patrick. Right uh, let's see. Uh, I've got up on tap uh, Tim and then Allison and Mariah. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Butch, for this, uh, for this presentation, this update. Um, obviously, really, really appreciate all the work y'all do, and, and especially getting that grant to free us up for all that money. That's, that's huge. So um, uh, the first question I had was, uh, so you, you talked about the, the need for uh, the fact that we have those really dense uh, – ridership uh, routes, like on Riverbend Parkway, the UGA crash really high. Have we looked into possibly getting articulated buses for some of those routes so that we could actually have uh, more capacity on the buses there? We did. We looked at articulated buses about uh, probably six or eight years ago. Uh, there are some cost issues that go along with those buses. They are more expensive. Uh, at the time, uh, the leadership did not want to have those 60-plus foot buses. Sometimes 65 foot long buses uh, in our community. There are challenges to operating those vehicles in and around our community. Some of our streets really are not conducive to architects. Uh, they work well if you've got bus only lanes and things like that, and four lane wide streets. But when you uh, you have to create Lumpkin Street uh, and make that right turn on the broad with an articulated bus, I, I think it would be a little challenging. Not that we couldn't do it, but uh, We've looked into it in the past. It just was deemed not beneficial for us at that time. Okay. I mean, because now I think UGA does have some articulated buses, I believe, in their fleet, right? I do not believe so. No, sir. Not that I know of. And not, not a, something new. I no? don't think okay. they have any. Uh, I, I'm not in the last year or so. If they've got something okay. that's new in the last year. Okay. Um Okay, appreciate that. It's something that I know that's like uh, other, especially college communities, for some of those routes, you know, that's, that's been an answer. I understand every community is a little bit unique, but. Uh, um, if I might say something. Uh, if, uh, if I could, sir. Uh, one yeah. thing we do want to think about, though, as we move into our update of our TDP, we need to really look at the, the ridership changes and the ridership patterns that are happening out there. Uh, since 2018, 2017, you know, Uber and Lyft have really changed the landscape of how individuals travel. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we made those types of investments, I, I would really like to look at our 
overall ridership demographics and, and look at really what's going on in the ridership world before we start deciding on what types of equipment we want to buy. Yeah, definitely. Definitely agree with that. Just just speaking to like you talked about the like on, on River Bend needing three buses to come through. And of course we talked about the real expense there is the operation, having a driver for each one of those buses, that if we could somehow have an articulated bus and a, on a route that works, and if the if the need was proven there, I could see a reduced cost but increased ridership. Um, but just the idea. Um, and uh, and to to uh, Take you back a little bit on Commissioner Thornton's comments um, about the fantastic job that our, our operators do. Um, definitely commend them. We need to make sure that we're protecting them and keeping them in a working environment that is uh, that is positive, that they're good on. And I think it. I mean, they were they were definitely did an amazing job throughout this entire pandemic, and they still are. But especially that kind of like lockdown period. And I'll just bring up again because I know I've brought it up a few times. I know a few of us have. Um, the idea of having a, a hazard compensation package for those employees, such as our drivers who are putting themselves in uh, dangerous situations and still are. Um, I've ridden the bus twice now since we've kind of gone to lockdown, just to kind of want to see how it all works and everything. And uh, they're doing a great job, but it's obvious that if they're trapped in that in that in that vehicle with air circulating through there, um, they're still in at, at more risk than they would than most people would be, and most of our employees. So, uh, it's something I want us to prioritize. Um, and then, just to speak to the to the needs, uh, the funding needs that you that you brought up. Um, looking at the fact that yeah, we're at a thirty percent lower general fund contribution than we did back in FY seventeen. Those numbers just kind of went down. That and the, the divestment that we kind of had from there. And that's, you know, I, I think public transit is one of those things that has a real community need. And um, so many people depend on it just for their life and their livelihood and just being able to live. Um, so I, I, I know I, I at least speak for myself that, you know, I'm, I'm definitely uh, excited and willing to uh, increase that general fund contribution, especially until we can bridge that time that the mayor brought up with uh, the next coming peace plot. But outside of that, just uh, really appreciate all the work that you and your staff do. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I've uh, I've still got Allison, uh, Mariah, and Andy who haven't spoken, and then I'll circle back. Um, okay, thanks. I'll just get to my question for some more information. I really like the details of uh, which that you have on slide 18, the one with the four color bar graph. I was wondering if we could get a separate PDF of that so that we can read the numbers that go with each of those columns. I, I printed it out on a full page, but I'm still not able to appreciate those numbers. And then um, if I, as a reminder, could you give us uh, maybe a summary as a follow-up of the each of those categories? It's my understanding that the fare box that comes in uh, is relative to what how much the federal amount that we get in, as well as uh, maybe a description of the enterprise fund, so that we so that we have just sort of a description of each of those categories. I can do that, ma'am, and, and it's not quite correct. The fares the fares are separate from any federal money. Okay, the fares are just fares. They're just okay. whatever we collect. Now it is the fair revenue does include the UGA contract. So when I, I, I when I talk about a fair box revenue, that's money. You know, we we collect money at the fair box that includes the UGA contract and fair revenues. What we have here is uh, the general fund revenue. We we have fair box revenue, and we have grant revenue. That's the three primary streams we have. The fourth stream that we have starting in 2018 is Transit Enterprise Fund net position. And basically what that is, is because we're an enterprise fund, we, we have revenues that roll over each year. And so they kind of stay in the enterprise fund. Back in, we had prior to some policy changes in, in 2017 or 18, its goal was try to keep the enterprise fund up. So say at the end of the year, there's $100,000 left over in the transit enterprise or operating grant, or sorry, operating budget. That money would roll into the enterprise fund and it would build up. And we, we had over, we had about $4 million in that fund. 
what we would use that during that fund, say a grant opportunity came along and a, for example, the, the grant that came out for the hybrid electric buses, it came out and we didn't have general fund match for that. We didn't have approved money for that, but we had money in the enterprise fund net position. So we were able to move money from that position as match for that grant. That helped us buy some of those buses, those 12 initial buses we first got. So basically it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say leftover revenue, but it's revenue that wasn't off, that wasn't in the year obligated, but it moved into the next year because of the way the enterprise fund set. Now, what I'm getting to, though, is in 2018, we had a change in policy, and instead of not using that revenue, we started spending that revenue. So we started using that revenue to draw down the general fund match. So we went from two point five million dollars or so in 2017 general fund match to 2.8 million and so we used 750,000 or 900,000 whatever the number was that year I, I would be happy to share this spreadsheet with you guys and and give you an explanation of what each one of these are but basically these are the funding streams that we've used to keep trains in the float for the last five years uh, thank you butch i i I'm feel confident not everybody wants as much detail about that that I do. So if you'll just send that as a follow-up, I'd, I'd appreciate it. And you also mentioned the, the grant revenue. Which bar would the grant revenue go under? Because I'm not seeing a uh, grant bar. That, that's green. That's the green one that says federal. Okay, so the, so the grants we are, in, are, are, okay, with a subset of that. So that if you capture that in your description of each bar, on the, on the follow-up, that'd be great. Um, thanks for helping explain uh, that, and I think that's all I needed. I appreciate all y'all's good work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Mariah. Thank you, and thanks for this presentation, Butch. Um, one question that I had to piggyback off of um, what was asked by Commissioner Thornton. I was wondering if you could shed some light on the nature of some of the negative driver rider interactions to get a sense of if it has to do with fare or uh, bus service itself, or if these are interactions that are sort of ir uh, irresponsive of um, the service provided. Sure, I'd be happy to. A, a lot of times it's individual behavior, and it's really what it is. It may be a uh, substance abuse issue. It may be the person just having a bad day. It may be that the bus was late. Uh, however, when, when the bus doesn't arrive on time, you know, that's that, that person's day. The biggest challenges we see are probably some of our uh, uh, mental illness cases we're having in, in town, some of the homeless we have, uh, and basically substance abuse. Those are, those are the biggest ones we have. People get on the bus. They don't want to act appropriately. We have a set of rider rules and responsibilities that were, have been in place for many years. They're very general uh, to the norms of, of uh, civil activities and, and, and day to day life. And like if someone wants to get on a bus uh, carrying an open container, we won't let them do so. And then they may get irate about that. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's just they're agitated, it's heat, whatever I might relate it. But we actually have a report on every single incident we have. We have a barring policy that has been in place and was vetted through the Mayor and Commission uh, probably at least 10 years ago where there's a, a barring process, an appeal process, uh, a way you get someone to have the bar lifted. It goes through my staff, it goes through my office, and up to the solicitor's office uh, and with PD. And i, I got to say, PD has been very helpful with us when it comes to dealing with this, they're very responsive. If we have an issue on the bus, they, they're they there they're as, quick, as fast as they can get there. Uh, but in general, it's just what I would say, unruly behavior. Sometimes it's youth. Uh, sometimes we get a lot of youth riding the bus, and, and, and they keep, kids start acting out. They start getting loud, or they want to you know, swing from the stanchions while the bus is going down the road. And then the driver, because they're, they've they got to be insured safety for all passengers, says something to them, and then uh, next thing you know, they're being cursed at or spat at or, or even shoved. Uh, we've only had two, like I said, we've only had two physical assaults in the last probably three years, 
and we ho- we'd love to keep it like that. And I have to say, with dealing with a million plus riders a year, it's a very very low process uh, percentage, but it does happen, and it's getting worse. And that's what we're concerned with. There are some Aspen Clark County policies that are in place uh, that we use with the police department. I'd be happy to share those references uh, with uh, the managers, and of course, they can pass them on to you folks about impeding a Athens Clark County employee in the, in the process of their job and that type of stuff. That's generally what we use. Uh, it turns into trespassing if they violate those types of things and stuff. But it's few and far between, but it's two or three times a week in some cases. And, and, and like I said, in the last several months with all the stress that I think everyone in our world has been involved in, it's getting worse. And we just don't want to have an employee injured. And we think that we need to say, look, if you don't follow the rules that we have in place for riding the bus, you know, there's not a right to ride the public transit. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege is what we tell folks. If you don't want to uh, follow the rules and the proper norms and, and be civil with people or, you know, follow, you know, civil, you know, hygiene practices or whatever, we have to think about it because we've got a lot of federal guidelines that we have to go by and, Again, we could go into hours of that type of stuff, but it, 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 we just would like you guys to know what's going on. I'd be happy to provide a report uh, with numbers and types of incidents if you guys would like. Okay, that's really helpful. I was just wondering how many of these interactions pertain to like uh, bus tardiness or fares or things to do with service versus things that are just some of the duress that folks are under yeah. right now and in general among populations that ride the bus. So that's really helpful to know. Um, my second question was related to the transit development pe- plan. Does that plan include, wait, I wrote this down, um, w- where we decide to put stops that have seats and covers? Uh, not specifically. In some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't. Our, that, would, that would mirror into our bus stop improvement program. In the transit development plan, we look at corridors, we look at points of origins, we look at destinations. Anytime we set up a bus route, we look at all that. We look at employment opportunity, education opportunity, services, medical, anything, the demographics of the community along that corridor. Uh, Bus stops and bus stop amenities uh, are worked into that process. And in some cases, yes, they are identified. Generally, bus stops are placed somewhere between 750 and 1,500 feet apart along a bus route. That's kind of the norm in the transit industry. Uh, in your more densely populated areas, they're, of course, they're closer together. Uh, our bus stop improvement program that has been carried on since 2000, since the first bus stop improvement program was FOSS 2000. And we went out during those time frames and we identified locations we had boarding, at, the criteria has changed multiple times from number of boardings per day to the location to, you know, what was that, what the point of origin of the destination was. In our community now, I would say probably 95 or 98 percent of the bus stop need that we've identified has already been built, already out there, and is being used. There are locations where we are unable to make improvements because of traffic, right away, uh, sight distance, things like that. Because you know you can't stop a bus right around a curve uh, because you don't want somebody to come around the corner and rear end it. Some places we don't have right away enough to put in amenities uh, because the property owner doesn't want to lose a couple parking places or in front of their business. So there are a lot of different things that go into that. But we've got a very detailed. Uh, bus stop improvement program that looks at a, 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 just a, a ton of different demographic data about the location and how that location might be served. So I'd be happy to share that with you yeah, as well. It's, 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 it's not specifically outlined in the transit development plan, but a bus stop here, here, and here. Yeah. Okay. So I did have, I have had some recent requests from constituents to get some upgrades on those in my district and I was wondering if that might have been outlined here, but I will follow up with you via email with some of those questions. If you would, if you would please. We, we may have something coming down the pike because there's, there's a lot yeah. of stops coming in the next six months. So if it's already an amenity there, it's probably got a, uh, an improvement coming anyway. 
but we'd be happy to. That would be helpful for folks to know. Yeah. So I'll follow up with you about that. But yeah, that's all I had. Thank you. Well, and if you don't yeah. mind, Mayor, if I might, uh, Commissioner Parker, if you could direct any requests for uh, no, sure. yeah, I'll, staff yeah. action through the manager's office, and we'll follow up on it. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Thanks, Mariah. Andy? Uh, thanks, Kelly. So I'm not sure whether this question's for Butch or for the mayor or the manager, but it's the question I always ask when we're talking about transit, which is, um, you know, obviously we have a lot of people that uh, commute into the community from surrounding counties and surrounding municipalities. Um, that creates a lot of congestion on our streets and these kinds of things. Um, for those individuals, they have expenses involved in doing that, particularly with trying to pay to park uh, downtown or park on campus. So my, the question that I always ask is, have we um, done any outreach to any of the surrounding counties or perhaps more significantly the surrounding municipalities that have some dense population that's coming into Athens uh, about maybe partnering with them and, um, you know, for, for some uh, financial consideration, maybe um, running Athens Transit out to some of these uh, municipalities that may have large numbers of people that are commuting into Athens to come to work. So have we made any progress on that or are we still where we were the last time I asked this question? I, I'll, I'll start, Andy, and then maybe ask Butch and, and Blaine to follow up with any conversations they've had. And, and, and I'll share that I'm, I mean, I, I think I'm favorable toward that prospect for exactly the reasons that you note that, you know, if, if we can decrease the amount of congestion and the number of vehicles on the road, that benefits everybody. Um, I have had conversations uh, around other kinds of infrastructure partnership, like trails and, and rail to trail activity with city of Watkinsville council people and a little bit with uh, Coney County commissioners and actually a little bit even with um, Morgan County commissioners, you know, given the, the disused rail to trail prospect that goes through those communities. Um, if, if it's the will of this group, I'd be absolutely glad to um, formalize the conversations with Watkinsville or Oconee County. I mean, I would certainly be interested in that. As I say, I mean, it, you know, it's a benefit to us, obviously, but it's also a benefit to a lot of the people that, um, you know, that live in those communities. Um, you know, if they are, they work on campus, they have to pay to park on campus. If they're working downtown, they have to pay to park downtown. So the, the people that live in some of those, I would think it would probably be more beneficial to look at the municipalities because they have a higher population density than maybe the counties. Um, but I, I think that could be something that's obviously beneficial to us, but also, you know, beneficial to them. I'm not suggesting that we run transit out there, you know, gratis. I mean, I think that they would need to have some skin in the game. But mm -hmm. uh, I certainly think that that's something, you know, worth um, worth pursuing into the future. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think Melissa had follow up, and then uh, you know, be interested in getting everybody's feedback on that question. Um, yeah, I have some just some questions that came up in response to others' questions, but also my, my wheels are still spinning about um, the idea of additional revenue sources. And, um, you know, the, the Planning Commission is having conversations about, you know, what is essentially transit-oriented development. I'd like the attorney to look into the legality of us charging um, a per fee, a, a, a per parking space fee or, or tax on the property taxes um, or, or calling it a fee um, for some of this dense development that's on bus, bus routes. We want to, in, the, the theory is, you know, you encourage dense development on transit routes, you don't need as much parking, but yet, yet most of these developments are maxing out their parking racks. Even the ones downtown, we have new proposals for, for parking for you know, high rises in the, in the heart of downtown and they still want the maximum number of parking spaces. Um, and, and I'm wondering, if, you know, that development can be much more affordable if they, if they lower the number of parking spaces. Um, so I'm wondering if the attorney could look into the possibility of that as a revenue source. Um, I I'm, do have some interest in the ad revenue issue um you know i did i worked in advertising at one point in a former life um and i'm wondering you know if, if maybe if we had our own 
ad rep. Um, you know, someone who was very familiar with this community who could go out face to face in the community to solicit. <clears throat> ad um, I wonder if that would be more effective and, and possibly even cheaper. Um, and I do have some more questions about the bus hazards, especially can the, the driver hazards, especially in this era of pandemic. And I, I'd like the I'd like Butch to um, talk to us a little bit about um, the effectiveness of our new mask ordinance on the bus, um, if, if people are following it, and what and, and now that bus um, bus fares are being collected again, what additional measures are being taken to protect that driver as people are going to be coming in that front door, especially considering that this pandemic is actually on the rise. We're not even flatlining anymore. Um, and, um, you know, maybe if there's any research or, or uh, about the safety of riding trends, and I know riders are concerned. There are folks who don't want to consider riding the bus again. I know I have my concerns as, as, as I'm We'll be going back to work at UGA um, next week. Um, you know, and, and I've read some research that says it's not a terrible risk if, if all these proper precautions are taken. Um, I'm wondering how we can help get that word out to people. Are um, and also the the idea of our, our drivers that are, you know, experiencing um, issues with with elderly passengers and the idea of assault. I'm wondering if, it's, if spit, spitting at a driver is considered assault, and I'd like to, you know, propose, if not, that it is considered assault, especially in the, in the era of a pandemic. Um, so, I, you know, th those are a handful of questions I just came up with in response to others' questions. Okay, would you like me to address both of us, Ray? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, well, on the fares, actually, tomorrow morning is the first time we'll start charging fares again. Since uh, April, sorry, March 17th is when we went fair free because of the COVID-19. We have taken quite a few precautions. Uh, our drivers all have uh, face masks. They have shields that are available to them and rubber gloves. And we all, and also we have installed a plexiglass barrier yes. between the driver's seat and the fare box area. It's not a hundred percent. It's a, it covers about probably 70% of the area adjacent to the fare box. There's uh, some issues with glare and things like that you have to worry about at night when you have plexiglass barriers. And so this is kind of angled at a 45 degree angle from the front area of the fare box up toward the back of the driver's head. But it does give them some type of visible plexiglass barrier between them and the fare box. Our operators have been instructed not to handle cash fares unless they absolutely have to generally most folks are able to get the, the bills into the fare box, but occasionally they'll have to take one and straighten it out and to get it to work in the fare box. The good thing to know is about 70% of our fares are collected electronically, that being uh, UGA riders just swipe their ID card and stuff like that, so we don't have to touch those. And a lot of folks that use the multiple ride pass also, they, you can, you can, they use those. There is also the option of using token transit. We have an app that you can go on and actually purchase fares on an app, just like a, a user credit card or debit card. And when you get on the bus, you can redeem a single ride pass as kind of at a flash pass process. So you never have to touch any fare at all. You don't have to use any cash revenues or anything, which that's been in place for probably over a year now. It's been going uh, very well. When we were using it, it was doing very well. I think we'll probably see some more of that now. And again, you are correct. There are we have done some research on that, and COVID nineteen transmission via cash seems to be in a low risk category. We're actually more concerned in that category about the folks that actually count the cash and the coins later. Uh, you know, tomorrow morning when we download everything tonight, we'll have you know forty pounds of coinage and you know a thousand dollar bills that have to be straightened and packaged before they can be taken to the bank. So but we're providing those employees with the same protections that the other folks are getting to protect themselves about, uh, with uh, any COVID-19 related risks from that. As far as the uh, ads, uh, we have looked into, uh, in the past, we talked about doing interior, uh, having someone on staff to do ads, but we did elect to go with an outside source. Uh, the bigger part on that is the, is the production, is where the challenges come. Production, installation, things like that. We actually have had quite a few challenges with our 
local vendors being able to actually do the ads and do those in an appropriate manner. Again, uh, this month you're getting an agenda item moving forward where we've recommended to go with how advertising again. We can talk to them about getting more face-to-face uh, folks here in town. They do have uh, sales reps that are in town on a regular basis. Uh, I think that got all your questions. Um, I, actually, um, I, I you you didn't really address the the masked ordinance and and um, how is that going? Are are, are drivers enforcing Mask. it? Uh, they are. Uh, we, we've been doing so. Yeah, we've actually we we had uh, had an incident today where three uh, young people did not want to wear a mask and they were denied service. They right. offered them masks. We we did offer to give them to them, and they have them on the bus. Uh, they have them at the multimodal center, and they are available to anyone that needs one. Uh, we encourage you know only one. So we don't want you to get one, get on today, and get on tomorrow, and get on the next day, and get three different masks. But like these the masks we purchased are reusable. Uh, but we we've got very very high compliance with it. Like I said that's the three today. Uh, that's the only time. Uh, since the ordinance was put into place in the last week or so, but I've actually heard that there was a uh, uh, someone was denied service, but it, it was three young people, and uh, it was handled by the route supervisors and bus operator professionally. And when they were told they didn't want to wear the mask, they tried to give us the feel on it was their right and their freedom. And he said, "Well, it's, that's okay, but if you don't wear a mask, you don't, you don't get the right." And Thank they you. let them stop. Great. So, Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And and Judd, if you could look into that concept of parking space fees or taxes and, and, and revenue. Yes, I noted that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Melissa. I, I still see uh let's see, uh Tim and Mariah. Uh, Melissa actually hit on the main thing I wanted to bring up, which was yeah, the fair is coming back tomorrow and steps being taken to protect our drivers. And I guess this is my one follow up with that will be I mean, have we looked at how much we're going to actually be taking in for the fare box? And do we feel like it's definitely worth the potential risk of our drivers and stuff instead of just trying to keep it fare free at this time? Well, in, in the budget that was recently approved, there's about $950,000 in fare revenue that we have to collect one way or another or other, other funds are going to have to be uh, appropriated to do so. Uh, so in, in the budget you guys just approved, it was about $900,000 and change. Uh, we have already lost $35,000 of that by not starting to collect fares on uh, July 1st. It's roughly about eighteen dollars to $2,000 per day in fare box revenue that we lose by not collecting fares. Uh, that decision, of course, is up to, to this body. Uh, our directive is to start charging fares tomorrow, and uh, that's where we're going as of right now as our last directive. Okay. It's just my, my concern is, you know, that right now we have, well, I think one of the things that keeps the drivers the most safe is not only do they not have to interact with the fare boxes, but right now we have rear entrance. Riders only enter through that rear door, and we actually have a tape put up, I believe, right, so that people can even get close to the, to the drivers at this point. Um, I can elaborate. That, that act, that's actually changing in the morning. That tomorrow morning, we're going back to front door boarding. Uh, the tape will be removed. Uh, the passengers will be able to get to the fare box and, and pay their fare. And the wheelchair positions that are on the bus will be remain up at all times unless there's a wheelchair passenger. And we're still asking passengers to be seated behind the wheelchair positions which places them about eight feet back from the driver cockpit area. And we're also doing rear door exiting only. So they won't be allowed to come back out the front door unless they have a mobility issue. So that, that's part of the change tomorrow morning. The, the, there will be front door boarding. Plexiglass in play, is in place. Actually, uh, uh, Patrick has sent me a text that we are using UV light as well. There's some other stuff, stuff that we're using to help sanitize the buses also. So we're doing that on a regular basis. We have people that are cleaning buses every time they come in and out of the transit center. Uh, so when the bus comes in, someone goes outside, whether it's the bus operator themselves 
or one of the other staff people that we have, they're wiping down all touch, all surfaces that are touched and things like that. In some cases, we, we will spray a disinfectant spray as well and to uh, keep those buses as clean as possible. Uh, we've been very lucky with our uh, bus operators with a, a four thousand, four roughly 4,000 people a day. Uh, we've had about 30 exposures since uh, the uh, March 17th or so since we started counting these things, and we've only actually had, I think, three cases and our employees. So uh, we're doing really good at keeping the exposure and the risk down, and we're working very hard to continue that. Uh, as things are changing, of course, it's all it's adaptive every day. Yeah, and, and, and I appreciate that. My biggest concern, I guess, is like with the aerosol spread, which we're now learning is no possible uh for the virus and and i agree like we've we've been we've we've had some good luck here with these things been put in place but as of tomorrow we're repealing some of those steps that we took and so i'm a little i'm a little worried about that but i understand that right now the time crunch is difficult maybe for us to change i'd say like personally i would be open to a budget amendment to uh keep the uh current structure that we have in place right now uh that's me if, if rest this body was interested in that um and then the other thing I just want to uh, clarify for people who might be watching at home, because I know we're talking about a, a, a correlation between uh, fares and the federal funding. And, the, the, and like you said, there wasn't a correlation there, but there is a correlation between ridership and federal funding, correct? But like our stick funding, that is where that correlation is, how many riders we have, so like how many fares we have. Well, actually, our funding comes from the federal 5307 formula funds. They're, por they're portions uh, by Congress annually. And most of that's based on population, population density. Comes out in what's called the National Transit Database Report. You're welcome to look that stuff up, but we've got great numbers in that. The ridership, the stick program is stick is, is small transit intensive cities. That's a special pot of funding. It's one and a half percent of total allocations nationwide split between communities that are a hundred, uh, sorry, less than a million. Uh, I think it's the number right on there, but it's a small trend, a small urban 50 to, to uh, 200,000 is what it is. I'm sorry, 200,000 or below. And when we meet or exceed one of five different criteria, it allows for a, a different source of funding. Say, say, say example, it's $100,000 a year each of those five, if we exceeded all five of those criteria, which is exceeding the national average for cities of one million or more in those different categories, then we get a little extra funding from that. Most of that, though, actually comes from the University of Georgia's participation in the National Transit Database Program. athens Clark County Transit, on its own, might qualify for only one or two of the categories of the five. Mm -hmm. But when you put the UGA numbers in there, sometimes it's three, four, or even five of it. Actually, hey, girl, six yeah. But no, the bottom, it's but the still line, being gone on our part yet. Strong. So uh, you, You're not muted, Suki. <laughs> but the, uh, but that's, uh, the, uh, those numbers, that stick money truly comes from UGA's participation. And we have to be very grateful for them participating in this. I know we give them credit on their annual contract, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's several hundred thousand dollars a year. But if they were not participating in this program, we wouldn't see that hundred thousand dollars at all. So we, 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 you know, it's a great partnership. We have a great partnership with University of Georgia and, and their, their transit providers. Uh, and it's something that we, we, we work on and, and try to keep those avenues open every year and stuff. But, uh, the stick money is really comes from that. It's not coming from really our transit ridership in general. There's a lot of pots of money out there, a lot of different ways that this thing comes together that we call transit. Uh, a lot of different funding sources, like the, you know, from the, the capital funding. You know, we, we get 90% of our money comes from outside of the, our local government to oh. pay for buses. Pretty big deal. Oh, no, it's, it's a lot of different different sources. <laughs> Uh, Russell, I uh, I support you uh, engaging in bilateral negotiations with Mayor Bob Smith concerning uh, 
the rectitude of transit between Watkinsville and Athens. And I wish you luck, kind sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Russell. I am uh, always up for a good time. Uh, just be interested. Qu- quick straw poll. W- w- would other folks, you know, be interested in some, you know, whether it's municipal or, or county collaboration around transit? Kelly, I think that yeah. us getting out to the Veterans Hospital is a really critical partnership there. Um, it's just over the line. It's uh, medical care for our veterans who also can ride the bus uh, fare free. So um, that would be a priority place for me for you to start collaborating about. Yeah, and, and, and the bus, uh, that, that's sort of the terminus of uh, kind of our northern route there. That, that's and right. I, I that's think- right from constituents a lot who would like to see our bus go out to um, Epsbridge Plaza. Um, you know, we've got a lot of folks in Athens, Clark County who work there and I know it's, a, I know it's, a, you know, touchy issue, but um, that's an employment center and it would open up employment opportunities for Athens, Clark County residents. They could reach those places of business. Although it would also open up shopping opportunities and take tax dollars out. So that's a, maybe a discussion we could have more. In depth. Well, just, just so we manage expectations there, Butch, I think to add a new route all together is on the order of about $350,000. Is that right? Yeah, roughly between three hundred and three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year uh, for a uh, bus uh, for one bus to operate twelve hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, sir. I think it's worth mentioning too that there's the ability to to change some of our routes, and I think the transit development plan brought forth the concept of uh, those connectors um, further out because right now every route which comes back to the multimodal center, and that limits on an hour basis how far out you can go, and so. I think it was extenders where we were going to set up a couple of centers where, you know, uh, we could like go to the mall, say, and, and run some longer routes. But that also is an investment of funds as well. That's correct, sir. That was the remote transfer facilities. We actually had about $500,000 in the uh, t spots to build or design some of those. It did not include any operating funds for those. Uh, and, Speaking about Epps Bridge, Epps Bridge was one of the highest uh, requested corridors in the last transit development plan, 2017-2018 timeline. And at that time, uh, we we have, and not only that area, but we've talked to other communities around over the years. And in general, we don't get a lot of support at my level for supporting transit going into other communities. I don't think people have a, a great understanding of the benefit it could bring to them but that really that's a regional thing and i know we we use make course and i, I know mary gertz is on the make course policy committee uh, and there are regional studies out there and regional planning that's happening uh most of that's going into the uh road networks but there are opportunities to look at transit options in those plans as well but again your neighbors have to participate Thanks for that, Butch. Uh, any last questions? All right, everybody, uh, we are going to move on to the second item of this evening, our annual update on litter and illegal dumping in Athens. And uh, I know we've got uh, several Keep Athens, Clark County, beautiful and solid waste staff members with us. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. All right. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks, Thank Butch. You much. Hey, y'all. Can you hear me? This is Stacy Farrell. Sure can, Stacy. Oh, great, great. Well, um, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to come and share um, our annual update. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Stacy Farrell, the Executive Director of Key Bathrooms, Clark County Beautiful. And we have several other uh, KCCB staff on the call so that we can answer any questions that you may have as we go through the presentation. Um, so I just want to here we go. There we go. I just want to begin by just sharing some of the presentation highlights. Um, we're going to talk about the purpose of this, um, a little bit about the history for those that weren't here, and then um, some progress that we've had on litter abatement activities. Of course, some of the challenges we still face, um, and then the next steps. Um, 
I do want to say that, you know, it's important to keep Athens Clark County Beautiful staff and other uh, uh, partners in the government that we do remember that that beauty is a silent but powerful force and that we really do think that it makes our community safer, healthier and more livable. So that's part of why we want to, to keep coming and keep sharing um, what is going on in our community. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share with you the purpose, of course, like I said, was to provide Athens Clark County Mayor Commission with an update on some of the initiatives and accomplishments and opportunities um, and then challenges that we have um, experienced over the past year. A little bit of history. Um, in May 2018, we did come before you, um, the Solid Waste Department and Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful, to present data on um, the impacts of litter and blight in our community. Um, some of those impacts, uh, just to touch on that, uh, of course, are, are the reduction of property values, which can be up to lowered by 15% because of blight or litter, uh, the reduction in tax revenue, uh, decline in property sales, construction loans, et cetera. But there's also increased costs for government, uh, such as the calls for service that come into police and fire and code enforcement, um, along with refuge removal and disposal fees, and then maintenance costs for maintaining vacant lots that um, uh, are blighted. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is the decrease in citizen investment, and that's really important to us because we want their participation in our community. We, we really feel like people's sense of place can be impacted um, by the feeling of a dirty or unhealthy environment. Um, and so that's really important to us as well. So um, we also came into that presentation with some data that um, came from three different primary ACC departments. Uh, that would be building uh, permits and inspections, the Code Enforcement Division, um, the Central Services, the Landscape Management Division, and then the Solid Waste Department which would include the collections and keep Athens Park County Beautiful Division. And so we came to share our, oh, excuse me. We came to share our uh, cost for picking up litter in Athens Clark County. And it was quite shocking for everyone. Um, you can see it was a little over uh, $860,000 annually just to pick up litter. Um, and so we thought that that was just, it was something that we really needed to share because we needed to change some things. So what we did in that presentation is we, we talked about ways that we could break the cycle of litter. We talked about additional staff and some collaborative efforts um, that we thought might have an impact on litter and blight in our community. If you want to make note that um, those uh, three primary departments and the, the, the amount that you see there, that's that's only those three departments. We also have several other departments in the government that we consider secondary departments in terms of litter and illegal dumping. And, and that number, that 860,000, um, does not even include what they think they may um, spend annually. So that is that is important. Um, and so that's just a little bit of history um, I will say that we have tried to estimate the cost for um, litter and illegal dumping pickup for FY20, and it looks as though it's around $950,000. Um, and so that's sort of interesting as well. We've seen it go up a little bit. So we can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the positive things. In October 2008, uh, we were able to hire uh, the new litter abatement specialist, um, uh, and that would be Carlos Pinto. That's a great picture of Carlos. Um, he's actually passing out garbage bags at the Notre Dame football game. Um, and so he came to join our staff in March of 2019. What he does is he manages many of the litter-specific programs you can see there, um, many of you know these programs, the Adopt a Highway program, the Cigarette Litter Receptacle program. Um, he is uh, very active with litter education trainings and litter specific special events. Oh, am I frozen? 
There we go. Okay. Next is the, the litter abatement steering committee. Well, this is a this is a committee of about fifteen collaborating organizations. They represent nine different county agencies, um, and all these folks uh, in divisions, departments, uh, nonprofit organizations, and citizens have pledged to devote their time and resources uh, to address some of these litter challenges that we have. Um, the Litter Abatement Steering Committee met seven times uh, in the past two years um, with that, the mission to work towards a sustained reduction uh, in roadside litter and illegal dumping um, and all the associated costs that come along with that. So they're very committed to countywide collaboration, innovation, and um, really supporting education and learning how to do better with enforcement. Okay, one of the things that's, that's exciting that came from the Litter Abatement Steering Committee was this idea that we needed to really connect with our community members to better understand what their attitudes uh, and behaviors and even what their knowledge was about litter and litter laws. Um, and so what we did is we worked closely with UGA and a few graduate students and KACCB staff designed and implemented the county's very first community litter survey. Um, and this survey, we were very proud to say that we had over a thousand uh, respondents and uh, with a nice age range. Um, and you can see here that 85% of the respondents agree that that littering was a significant problem in Athens Park County. Um, and that 75% of those folks thought that the ACC government should maybe address that and put more resources into that. What we found interesting was that 77% of those respondents were unfamiliar with the Athens Park County litter laws and policies. So that was very, very interesting to our committee. Um, and so we we're trying to work towards better educating our community. And then lastly, um, the respondents did indicate that they wish that we would enforce our existing litter laws more strongly. All right. Another thing that uh, we did in this past year was to uh, conduct the Triangle Plaza neighborhood cleanup. Um, this was, this was acting on really one of the things that came back from that community litter, litter survey. And so the uh, Athens Clark County Police Department and the Solid Waste Department and Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful organized in the Triangle Plaza Neighborhood Cleanup, which is in District 2. Um, and that resulted in the collection of 2.35 tons of mixed waste, um, as well as 7.7 .7 tons of uh, tires. Um, that event, I believe it was only four hours. That was all collected. I believe it was four hours. Um, we were, we were, um, as you can see, lots of uh, staff. We were uh, very dirty and it seemed to be a very pleasant um, event for the folks in that neighborhood. Um, we did spend about $1,400 on the disposal fees. Um, and that uh, that is not including the staff overtime, which was probably somewhere around 12 staff. Um, we do hope that events like this, it was so successful. We really do hope that in the future we can get additional funding to do neighborhood cleanups in other commission districts, um, some similar special collection events, because we really do believe that um, these neighborhood specific cleanups uh, discourage the greater illegal dumping problem throughout the county. So um, we we did have a, and we had a great experience uh, working with uh, athens Clark County PD on that. So another thing that happened in that Triangle Plaza area was that the athens Clark County Police Department asked Solid Waste if, if we could install a few pedestrian trash cans in the Triangle Plaza um, to help reduce the uh, continual litter that they were finding in their parking lot. And so in November of 2019, uh, the Solid Waste Department installed five new pedestrian trash cans um, in that shopping area in the Triangle Plaza. Um, those cans uh, cost about a little over uh, $2,300. Um, and Solid Waste empties those cans now once a week. Um, and that's about 
what we've estimated $600 a year. So beginning in FY21, we are going to use neighborhood cleanup funds to help um, offset those costs. Oops. Okay. Um, another very interesting and messy um, <laughs> event that we did was called was the illegally dumped household trash bag audit. And that was very specific to household trash bags. So for five days in February, um, Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful and folks at Landscape Management and Code Enforcement worked together to do this household trash bag audit. And what we did is we collected almost full bags so that it wasn't just litter. It had to look like it was uh, kitchen trash, household trash um, throughout the county. Um, and then we mapped those locations uh, where the trash bags were found so that we could study some trends or see if there was a trend. Um, we did collect 13 bags during those five days um, from eight different locations. And um, we did have to open those bags and look through those bags. We did find one address in one of the bags that we then passed on to community protection so they could further investigate um, we did not really see a trend in the dumping locations. I would say that we noticed that um, the trend that we did notice is that, is that the individuals that were illegal, Ill illegally dumping their, their trash seemed to be very careful to not include personal information um, so that it would be traced back to their address. So that was, that was interesting. Uh, Carlos Pinto, our litter abatement specialist, he also completed um, quite a few litter education workshops with the athens Clark County Police Department. Um, these sessions were completed in an effort to both uh, educate the officers on state and local litter laws, but really also to brainstorm with the folks that are in the field um, so that we could better understand how to address enforcement challenges. You can see that um, we did six of these litter education sessions. So 59 officers received materials. Um, and there was just really, really great dialogue um, between uh, the officers and our staff and trying to really learn more. So that was, that was something that I hope that we continue to do. Cigarette litter receptacles, I'm sure you've seen these downtown. Um, this is a project of Keep Athens Park County Beautiful. We have 75 of these cigarette litter receptacles installed in downtown Athens. Um, and we empty them and service them and they are now all fully functional. Um, Carlos this past year decided that he would like to try to recycle those cigarette butts. So you can see that um, he was able to collect 59 pounds of cigarette butts from October 2019 to May 2020 and send them into TerraCycle to be recycled. We um, plan to continue to do that. Um, we just think it's a really interesting program. Um, we also implemented a new UPC which, uh, based inventory system called Asset Tiger to monitor those cigarette receptacle locations, um, to, to monitor their maintenance and, um, and repairs and uh, to identify broken or, or missing units. So that's been a really great new program that we implemented for, the, for those cigarette receptacles. And then we also received a very small grant to fund two new um, receptacles for for folks who didn't know, like many years ago, Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful has received several rounds of grant funding to purchase uh, these receptacles. Um, and then they are, uh, they are uh, locally designed and, and, and made, um, and they are very sturdy. We, we wanted to adhere to some of the historic um, design and nature of downtown Athens. So, so we have over 75 of those. I have a quick, quick question about that. Um, what do they make out of recycled cigarette butts? Do you have any idea? I'd never known that you could recycle cigarette butts, and I'm really curious to know. Toothbrushes, right, Suki? Made out of old butts. 
<laughs> um, so I'm not sure that, um, I, and Carlos is on the call. I'm not sure if they've shared with him what they do with um, them when they recycle them, if they turn them into something else. I, I do have a PDF that I can share with everybody, but in a nutshell, it says that um, they process the butts and then they, they make in the processing, they make a cellulite acetate pellets that are then combined with other plastics such as poly, polyethylene and polypropylene and used for new plastic products such as ashtrays, shipping pallets, or plastic lumber. Okay. Mm. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that's very, very interesting, yeah. Um, but I'll that's... <laughs> Um, another uh, another um, thing that we have done over the past year with guidance from the Litter Abatement Steering Committee is we have engaged in new community outreach events. Um, we really took a look at who we were, our audience was and whether or not we were speaking to the choir sometimes and how we really wanted to um, just really get out into sort of some new um, communities. And so we did collaborate um, and partner with several um, other folks and other events, including here you can see the, you know, East Athens Fr First Friday events, uh, the ACCPD National Night Out, um, some of the leader services cookouts. Um, and so we really tried to get out and um, spend a little bit more time with different communities so we can look at this litter issue. Okay, another thing that we um, have been working on are um, some GIS mapping. Um, this is something that we are just, we are really interested in doing, interested in doing um, across different departments because so many of us really do touch litter in different ways. And so right now we're, we're collaborating with uh, the GIS department to, to, to um, create a centralized data collection so that we all can pinpoint the locations of litter and illegal dump sites. And then that way we feel like we'll be able to come back and sort of analyze um, if there are patterns, um, if there are uh, other illegal dumping issues um, that we sort of can see, and then we it might even change uh, some policies. So we're really excited about that. It's not, um, completely ready, but when it is, um, we're hoping to use the collector app and um, allow for many different departments to use it. So we're real excited about that. Um, for those of you that noticed, uh, this is a uh, great American cleanup time. We are doing what's called trash your size um, and trying to um, really advocate for folks to get out and be healthy and while they're exercising, help clean up our community. Um, I will say that normally this is a spring event. And of course, because of COVID, we had to uh, sort of redirect some of our efforts and to be safe and healthy. Um, we waited to do uh, any sort of cleanup events until June 1st. But we have had several folks participate in this. And this is just something that um, Athens Clark County residents and employees um, can do um, to be active in their community. And in fact, Athens Clark County employees get wellness points um, to participate in trash or size. So that is something that uh, we would encourage folks to, to participate in. Um, there are several programs that we do that are ongoing successful programs, our adopt a highway programs. We have over 70 active groups that um, just volunteer to do litter cleanups. We also have our down and dirty events where these are sort of more like one-time events where um, youth groups or church groups can say, well, I don't really want to adopt a road, but I do want to, I really want to make an impact. And so we send them out to either illegal dump sites or some of these roads that are consistently um, littered. And so we do a lot of those 52 cleanups last year. And then we, we do quite a bit with our school um, community. Um, we have uh, the Green Schools program where we do quite a few presentations to the students as well as to citizens. Um, and they also do cleanups. So we're really trying to teach our youth how to 
have ownership of our community and to keep our community clean um, so it does feel safe and healthy. Um, the annual Keep America Beautiful Litter Index Survey, which is different from the, um, the community survey I was uh, referring to before, um, this, this, this is an annual survey um, that we do where we look at commission districts um, and we evaluate six roads in each district and, um, and then we come up with a score for that district. This is something that's mandated by our national organization, Keep America Beautiful. So we're, we do need to do this each year. Um, but it is a good uh, gauge to specific roads um, in our community and what's happening on those roads. Last year, we had 31 volunteers, um, staff, board members, and commissioners that participated. Um, and folks rate these roads on a scale from one to four. Um, last year, the litter index showed that Athens overall score was a two, which is equivalent to what that picture looks like. It's slightly littered. But it's important to note that um, on average, a lot of roads, this is just an average. So a lot of roads are scored much higher, um, you know, threes or three fours, which are considered very litter, very littered. So there is, there's still a lot of work for us to do in our community. In December of 2019, um, Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful staff made available a sort of at a glance for each commission district, which offered um, a year in review regarding where their district fell in line, dirtiest to cleanest, um, the number of volunteer cleanups that were conducted in their district, and the number of trash bags and recycling bags that have been collected. We really hope that this helps um, our community leaders uh, understand what's happening in their districts and encourage them to get citizen involvement. Um, because again, like I said in the beginning, we really believe that uh, a clean community to many people feels like a safe community and a healthy community. So we would like to encourage all commissioners to complete this survey annually. We did not do this survey this year because of COVID. And so we will do it again um, beginning next spring. Now, I think we need to discuss a couple of our litter abatement challenges. And this is actually what an illegal dump site looks like. If you've never seen one, this, uh, these are the type of calls that we get and some of the challenges that we have look just like this. Um, one of the challenges that we have right now um, are many homeless camps in our community. Um, and the homeless camps present a very interesting challenge in terms of litter um, and safety and um, the cleanliness of our streets. Um, solid waste in, in general, and then Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful, we provide citizens and land, landowners with tools whenever they'd like them to conduct cleanups of homeless camps. Um, many of you may have noticed um, there was a Chase Street homeless camp, so in March, um, that land that's owned by Canopy, Canopy Studios was cleaned up. Um, and Solid Waste really supported them and helped them by providing um, trash and leaf and limb collection um, at a discounted rate. Um, we do really want to continue to partner with property owners uh, and groups to do similar activities um, and to, to help the homeless camp effort. Um, it is a challenging effort in terms of litter. Um, and so we are trying to work on that. Another challenge for us right now is on um, the Georgia Department of Transportation uh, litter contract. Um, in the past, the GDOT contract has provided litter pickups, tree maintenance, grass cutting, um, you know, removal of objects, curb and gutter cleanings, um, on all of the state routes routes that come through our community, which would be you know 10 and 15 and 29 and 129, um, we do have quite a few state routes that come through our community, um, and so it's challenging right now because they uh, we currently do not have a contract with GDOT. Um, it is on hold, and um, 
not having that contract will result in the long-term presence of a lot of roadside litter on a lot of roads that come through our community. Um, historically, these litter pickups were a uh, high priority for the GDOT inmate crews on those main thoroughfares and gateways into the community. It's important for folks to know that we can't really send volunteers out on those state roads routes that are busy. It's just not safe. Um, we don't, uh, we, we really can't do that. So um, those We've been told by our contacts at uh, GDOT also that the state budget cuts for FY21 are indicating a 14% reduction in services, which they think will be even less litter cleanups in ACC. So um, that's that's one of that's one of our challenges. Um, a lot of different departments get phone calls about state rightaways, um, and we uh, have. Uh, it's very challenging for us to figure out what to do. So what are some of the next steps? Um, we hope next year uh, we will be able to do the Great American Cleanup in the spring, but for now we're going to do it this fall. So we invite everyone to participate. Um, we are uh, going to resume the litter index next spring as well. Um, we would like to do what is called a litter brand audit. Um, and that is, is similar to the household trash bag audit. But in fact, it's collecting the litter that we see on the side of the road and categorizing it. Uh, is it fast food? Is it aluminum cans? Is it plastic water bottles? Um, and so we're, we're very interested in doing that when we do feel like it's safe to do that. Um, we had planned to do what was called the Secure Your Load Day in June. It's a national um, Secure Your Load Day, um, but because of COVID, we had to cancel some of those plans. Um, we are working with the attorney's office to develop a court-appointed uh, litter education class for folks um, who uh, are caught littering. It is a way to educate them and to share with them why we feel like this is, uh, it is important to keep our community clean. Um, and also share our local litter laws. Um, we were asked at one point to look into, um, excuse me, look into cameras, surveillance cameras. Um, and we did send out some of that information um, a few months ago. Um, in general, it's, it's you know, it, there is a, a location in Arizona where they have done this. Um, and they have been able to, to catch many folks that are illegal dumping, similar to sort of the picture that you see here. Okay, so we really do feel like we've made a lot of progress. The Litter Abatement Steering Committee has just been such a, a, a positive and impactful collaboration. Um, we are hoping to have um, an increase in funding for neighborhood cleanups. Um, I think we did get a little bit of an increase this year, but we do see that as a way to stop this uh, larger community-wide illegal dumping um, on some of these uh, uh, more remote roads. Um, we also would, are gonna advocate for the Georgia Department of Transportation litter control contract because we do, we work with them and we understand what this, the impact is. Um, and and it's, it's challenging for staff um, to know what to do on these state routes when we get citizen complaints. And then um, we would like um, commissioners to, to think about that camera surveillance program to go over some of that information that was sent out previously to see if that's something that we want to try and do in our community. Um, and so without further ado, <laughs> I'll take any questions. We have um, Suki is on the lines uh, along with, you know, Stacey and Carlos. So please let us know if you have any questions. She, uh, Allison. Thank you for seeing my hand. Uh, great job, you guys. That was a great presentation. It captured so many of the things um, that I know about because I've been on the litter um, abatement steering committee up until I guess last year when Patrick uh, took over being a commissioner liaison on it. Um, I think it's really relevant for Patrick with his district and the fact that it doesn't have our ACC Gov solid waste service zone. 
um, I, I would predict that details would show that some of the um, the, the dumping is happening uh, relevant to people who don't have the service um, that is predominant in my district, but um, as well as the rural dumping sites. I am. I hope that when the time comes for us to talk about the cameras, that we can work a way for that to be uh, an enforcement mechanism um, for us. What I saw with that household garbage bag dumping that you guys did the audit on, they clearly don't like to recycle either. So they, I saw the aluminum cans in the trash. For those people who uh, don't care one way or the other. And then um, the year in review that you... Uh, talked about that was great that Carlos did that. Um, it's the first time I'd seen all those numbers for my district and for the commissioners that didn't get that, it was delivered um, into our city hall mailboxes. So that's how we received that report. I think, I'm not sure if it was also in email, but um, it's some interesting information. I really appreciate the data that you guys collect um, because it is informative and can give us uh, direction for um, ways to go going forward so i just wanted to say that and thanks for the presentation and all um that was all i wanted to say thanks thanks allison mariah um, you might be muted i always do that thank you thank you very much melissa um and thank you for this presentation it's great to hear what you all are doing and how you're you know Working around what's happening with COVID right now. Um, on the GDOT litter contract, um, if it's not safe for volunteers to do this work, I don't think it's safe for inmates to do so either and have, you know, argued many times that in general, the, the utilization of unpaid inmate labor is immoral. And so if we could figure out a way for us to either have non-coercive form of volunteerism, take care of those needs, or else, if you all are interested in requesting funds to pay folks to do that work, uh, I'm certainly interested in that. But um, if we are, if, if, you know, as you argued, it's not safe for volunteers to do that work. Um, it's not safe for anyone to do that work unpaid. And so that's it. Thanks, Mariah. Melissa? Yeah, I've got a whole list of questions. And I, I'll, I'll start with that GDOT track. Um, or, um, we talk about um, the, the a litter, what do they call it, a, a litter offender class and surveillance. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps we could um, turn to folks like that who are actual litter offenders to um, participate in some of these cleanups. And, um, you know, possibly, in, you know, I, I am all for in increasing surveillance at known dumping sites. I feel like all you need is a wildlife can. Um, and actually, I don't recall ever getting the information about that. Um, it might have gotten buried in my inbox. These past few months have been insane. So if you could resend that, that would be really helpful. Um, I also think approaching fraternity houses um, would be a good idea. I know you guys do some direct um, places in my district that I that to be the most littered or I guess most community complaints and often the communities themselves around these places um, are, are areas where we have fraternity houses. Um, I always pick up litter. Well, I always would pick up litter on my way home from the bus when I pass the fraternity house on um, right the McDonald's. Um, so I wonder if we could turn to, to those folks. And I know that some of these fraternity members have, you know, community service requirements. Um, so that, that might be, you know, place to directly turn. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to, um, you know, having people directed to do their community service requirements and picking up litter. Um, you know, there are plenty of, of um, offenses where people are, are um, assigned community service rather than jail time. So I wonder if we could, you know, meet some of those needs through, through those kinds of um, situations. Um, the homeless camps. Um, I mean, this is a, problem, a serious homelessness problem in our community, and I fear that it's only getting worse. I, I fear that we're going to have many, many more people out of a home um, as this pandemic rages on and evictions start up. Um, and 
over and over again, I advocated for us some public land to um, enable some safe um, monitored homeless encampments that have facilities and, and litter receptacles. So these places can be safe and sanitary and, and somewhat monitored um, to offer these folks some options. And, 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 you know, there are some homeless folks who prefer camping over any over shelter. Um, I, I've known some of them personally. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, oh and the, 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 the neighborhood cleanups, how does one initiate one of those in an area? Um, what, what would be the proper procedure for that? I, I have some, um, I feel like there's some need in the Rock Springs, H.T. Edwards, Clark Central area. Um, you know, there's always been a lot of litter in that neighborhood. And there actually are some illegal dumping sites that have been addressed from time to time. And there's some screens that end up everywhere. So uh, I'd be interested in some information on, on, you know, how to possibly initiate that and, and um, get some community groups on board with one of those in, in that neighborhood. Yes, absolutely. We um, we can give you some information. And really, the larger Triangle Plaza cleanup was the first that we've done like that. Um, and so we learned a lot. Um, we felt like it was um, it was a very positive event. We felt like the, the community members really appreciated it. So it, it is sort of a new initiative. Um, and so please do let us know if that's something that you would like to do. Um, I would. It's a bigger, it's a, you know, it's a little bit, um, we have, it's a little bit more planned process than just a, you know, a, a streetwide cleanup. We certainly have to look at roll-offs and staffing. And um, so, but absolutely, that's, that's one of the things that we really think we need to do in our community. Yeah. And there are community partners who work in that, in that direct neighborhood that I think would be interested in participating and bringing volunteers to the table and other resources. I'm sorry I got to jump in again since I'm on the phone. Uh, but one thing that I noticed in, in my neighborhood in District 9 um, behind the old Hardee's is where people are dumping um, clothes and um, blankets. And they are um, dumping them in those um, those clothing boxes for donations for, I guess, different charities, but they're running over, they're in the street. And now that building is empty, but those um, those boxes are there, but all of the um, donations are spread all over uh, the ground. Because that is an un unoccupied business at this point, who is responsible for that? Um, clean up. Um, is it the people who have the boxes there? Or, I mean, even if we sent code enforcement to these um, donation spots, who is ultimately responsible for the, those uh, those dumps? Hi, this is Suki. My, am, I, uh, am I unmuted this time? <laughs> Not muted. I apologize earlier. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I've been scared of the mute button since Butch's presentation. So um, anyway, I I'll jump in on that one real quick. Um, those boxes are a contract between the property owner and those companies. The unfortunate thing during COVID, all those companies pretty much ceased operation. Um, textile recycling has crashed uh, because of COVID and the fear of spreading that COVID to other places around the globe. Um, ultimately, it, it is the companies that place those boxes there, their responsibility. The unfortunate thing, Commissioner Thornton, some of them have gone out of business due to COVID. And so then it becomes the property owner's responsibility. Um, but I can get that one looked at. Um, we've been getting complaints from several around the community. I will say also this year, I would like to bring forward to you guys, some communities uh, have a little bit more control over those boxes and where they go. Um, Gwinnett County is one that has um, done a better job at 
uh, placement and uh, pick up of those those containers, which um, actually helps prevent these issues from occurring. So I will um, bring more information about that moving forward. I don't know if that helps you or, or not, Commissioner Thornton. It, it, it helps me. I'm, I'm glad that you are aware. Um, actually, I was going to call somebody tomorrow about it. So I'm glad this is on your radar. And Suki, while I have you, has nothing to do with this um, really good, good presentation. But can someone please come on Fowler Drive and, and cut the fairway on Fowler Drive? The weeds are like super high, super bad. Uh, I was going to call you about that tomorrow also. But uh, if someone can check that fairway uh, right at the bus stop, uh, it just needs to be cut. I mean, the, the grass is like up to shoulder length. I think the Thank manager you. can make a note of that. I've got uh, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> just two quick questions or um, one real quick question. I can help you with the, the litter brand audit. Um, most of what I see is like Wendy's and uh, Popeye chicken boxes. Um, so just want to give you a heads up on that. But um, when it comes to like these apartment complexes that um, – they really don't do a really good job with stormwater. Um, is there anything that we can do with, you know, maybe having an abatement or uh, some grants that help stop, like, uh, like um, residents' residue from, you know, filtering into or seeping into our our streams and creeks? Well, we can look at the various. Uh, you know, for most of our storm inlets, we do have. Uh, grates uh, down into the pipe, but there's ditches and all sorts of things. Um, I do know that the sustainability office is, is partnered with Solid Waste and attracted some funding to install a trash trap as a pilot in one of our area streams to try to pick um, trash as it's flowing down uh, the waterway. And uh, we've got some more information that we can share with you, but the, that is moving forward as a pilot here uh, this month. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Russell? Thank you. Um, I'll add my voice. I, I support the uh, use of wildlife cameras around prominent known phantom dump sites to uh, enforce the law. Um, speaking of the law, Major Williams, could you please let me know let, we'll let the commission know about the status of litter ticketing in town. How many how many tickets have been written? What, what we're looking at in terms of a current enforcement regime, please, sir. Maybe uh, the number of tickets written monthly for the past year. Something yes, like sir. That. Thank you. And um, I'll I'd, I'd back up. Commissioner Davenport's statement on the on uh, the necessity for the stormwater grates in areas where we don't have them, maybe just aging infrastructure that don't have those grates. Those certainly help keep litter from entering the waterways. So if we could explore maybe a stormwater fee abatement coupled with a property owner investment in a stormwater grate. I don't know, something like that. So, but thanks y'all. Thanks for the work you do. I, I hate litter. So let's get it picked up. Thank you. Tim. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah. And the, the first thing I just wanted to say was, I, I know uh, Christian Wright brought it up that uh, mission district at a glance. I was, I was really impressed by that getting that letter. I know a lot of work went into it. Um, it gave me a, a, a much better idea of the litter and trash situation in my district. And so uh, uh, thank you for doing for doing that work. It was really helpful. Um, on the on the homeless camp uh, situation with trash, um, I mean, from some of my communications, I remember uh, visiting the, the homeless day center and just talking to some of the individuals coming through there and just kind of li listening to some needs and without me even bringing it up had two different individuals who lived in campsites and when i said like what 
you know, what could be improved? That what what could the county do to improve your situation and stuff? Uh, two of the individuals brought up unsolicited just the presence of garbage cans, um, and just having them there, and and just knowing where the the, the larger camps are, and having cans there, and then having you know some kind of structure that we can work with to have them picked up. Um, I mean, this is coming directly from the individuals living there. I think that that could be a, a proactive uh, way that we could be um, reducing the litter in those areas. You know, we now have a, uh, a street outreach coordinator uh, that does uh, outreach with the, with the homeless communities. So I'd love to see uh, Solid Waste teaming up with uh, teaming up with him to maybe find a way that we could just simply have a few garbage cans dropped off in some of these higher up uh, uh, homeless population areas and, and figure out a way to get them picked up. Um, I think it'd be a, an easy cost effective thing for at least to explore. Um, I'll definitely uh, uh, double down on the, uh, on the cameras. I'm sure we could find funding to do that. So I, I did a little bit of research and it looks like it's been effective in other communities. And uh, just in general, I'm uh, really impressed with uh, this department and all the work they're doing, very innovative, everything from Recycling cigarette butts, I didn't know it was a thing either, to this uh, litter brand audit, which, uh, yeah, I think that would probably bring back some really interesting information and maybe places that we could go back to businesses uh, and, and, uh, and basically try to work with them and say, like, hey, we're finding a lot of your litter with your brand on there. How can, if this doesn't look good for you, how can we reduce this? So um, just, uh, yeah, props to y'all for all the work you're doing and uh, keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if I could, um, and uh, I wanted to uh, speak to Commissioner Denson's comment because Co Commissioner Parker had brought up a similar concern, and and I just wanted to share our conversation uh, and and work with y'all to help find solutions. But um, oftentimes, the homeless camps are on private property. Uh, we don't know if they are there with permission or without permission. Um, I know that one homeless resident that contacted Commissioner Parker, you know, even wanted to help. Uh, you know, coordinate the pickups there. Uh, and one thing that, um, you know, I don't know if we recognize the camps there or if we, you know, if we engage the private owner, they may want to push the people off of there. Uh, it, there's just a lot of issues there with, with, with the homeless camps. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough problem for the people that live there as well. And so we just, let's continue to talk about that and how we can try to make that a try to find a good community solution. Melissa? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if some of these encampments are adjacent to public right-of-ways or near a prominent public right-of-way where we could just simply put some trash receptacles in that right-of-way nearby and occasionally, you know, have, have the homeless coordinator occasionally visit just to remind folks that there is a trash receptacle nearby. I wanted to ask uh, Stacy. Um, you know, aside from Rivers Alive, is there any uh, organized activity around river and large stream cleanup? I think about Trail Creek, and certainly both branches of the Oconee River seem to experience a, a fair bit of regular litter. Yeah, we do um, a lot of work with uh, our stormwater coordinator, and so we're able to identify some of those more littered creeks and streams around the community. So we just don't clean up on that, you know, October Rivers Alive date. We do it throughout the year. Um, we have done sort of different programs throughout the years where we had some graduate students that worked with us, uh, you know, to, to identify types of litter. And you know. but we do uh, have lots of groups that um, that is what they would like to do. They would like to adopt a stream or not just a just a road, uh, they could be going into, you know, a creek or a neighborhood where they've received permission to go. So we we do that actually on a, on a regular basis. The Adopt a Highway program, I, I like to sort of share it as though there's like an umbrella, which we, that's the Adopt Athens program. And underneath that falls Adopt a Highway, Adopt a Bus Stop. You know, we work with Butch and we adopt these, the folks adopt uh, these bus stops. We have Adopt a Stream, Adopt a Park. And so we do have folks uh, in those programs that are interested specifically in waterways and water quality 
Um, uh, and then locally, we do a lot of work with UOM, the Upper Upper Oconee Watershed Network. Um, and so, uh, you know, throughout the year, we often will do work with them as well. So I guess, I guess to answer your question is that we just don't do waterway cleanups once a year. It's happening throughout the year. Um, and so, uh, you know, we really, we look at litter everywhere <laughs> in the community. So. Great. Thanks for that. All right. Well, I appreciate the work that you do every day. Um, we're a better community for it. Um, all right, uh, everybody, let's go ahead and take a uh, five minute break and then we'll go ahead and begin our executive session and it'll give public information a chance to sign off. Thanks, Suki and Stacy and Stacy and Carlos. Could I actually ask Thank a you. question really quickly? Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Mariah. Um, this is just a general question. It was brought up um, during our budget deliberations. Uh, I think particularly the voting meeting that uh, we'd like to have a work session on participatory budgeting. And I know we haven't done it in the last week or so, but I also saw that it wasn't on the agenda for August. So I was asking when we can expect to have that work session. I sent out an email uh, asking for everything that people wanted going into our September budget and goal setting planning session. So um, look for that. And then I'm interested in kind of that bigger collection sort of working up to then. Okay. 